This podcast is brought to you by Steed Motor Group, Clare Galway. For your personalised vehicle shopping experience, find out more at steedmotorgroup.ie. So you're welcome to this week's edition of the Football Podcast, where we're going to look back on the senior semi-finals and the intermediate semi-finals. So we now have uh, Kerfin, uh, Mike Cullen, senior final, which a lot of people expected. And then uh, Munave Abbey uh, played Kilconley in the intermediate uh, final, which was probably touted by a lot of people as well at the start of the year. So... No major su- surprises, Mars, with the two teams we have in senior and intermediate finals. No, uh, two games that you get very easily excited about, but not not major surprise. I think if you're that set out start of the intermediate year, you're probably saying one of Brannock's one of to back up or Kilkenny to get to a final would it end up being of the two, and that's the way it's panned out. Um, similarly, it's probably at a senior level. It's probably interesting enough from a Carfin and McCullum perspective that they both. They seem to time this very well. Um, you know, from a Carfin getting a lot of their nineteens in throughout the league and then filtering some of their older heads in as the championship wear on, to the extent where you see, you know, multiple All Ireland winners coming on at the weekend, which is fairly kind of formidable. And we call them doing something similar. So probably a testament that both managers knew they were going to be in the shake up around this time of the year and knew they could maybe give lads the leeway to let Sean Kelly and Peter Cook go state side for the summer and come back in after group stage rejuvenated and all that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, not a major, not a major surprise. And more broadly, I do think they're two exciting finals. Um, but this is the way football is going in, in Galway to Minipal. You've probably seen, you know, my Cullen as a population just generally geographically and demographically is booming. Um, you see, Carfain are always going to be in rounding competitive. One of the stories of the championship for me actually is the fact that Milltown, like a really small rural club, managed to make it to a, a semi final. And one of the more worrying trends is what's happening to football outside of those areas in rural areas. Um, like from a West Galway perspective, you'd be really concerned when you see what happened to Carroll last weekend. Um, Spittle in, in the right bit of trouble, let them more in the right bit of trouble. Um, Bannock's going down and not coming back up. All of that is doesn't bode necessarily well. And post COVID, a lot of those clubs have even been more decimated by by immigration. But um, yeah, more broadly, like as from finalists, I think I'm very excited for these two games. I think there could be both right, open, entertaining matches. We start with the first game that was on. Saturday in the senior championship, my column on value. Just interested to get your own views on this. Did you find it an enjoyable game? Because even some people I can feel around me on Saturday felt it was this kind of game of modern football where both teams were holding on to the ball for long periods. There was at some stages team either team was kind of afraid to take risks. Did you find it enjoyable, intriguing, or what did you think of the game? Yeah, like this is the <laughs> this is the eternal debate in football right now and the where the, the game is at. And this is not just happening in Galway, there's club championships up and down the country bemoaning the, the standard of their games. And I wouldn't dismiss those concerns at all. And it was definitely more broadly, you'd be very you know seriously concerned about the direction football is going in and some of the rule trials they're introducing and maybe not necessarily tackling the, the issue at hand. But on this specific game, and I wouldn't dismiss anybody who of that a persuasion who wasn't entertained by, by it. But I thought this was really high end stuff. Um, like re, you know, it was a real arm wrestle. Uh, and all the kind of usual cliches about you know a chess match and intriguing and classic and all that kind of stuff. You could roll them out if you wanted to. But I just thought it was it was high end club football. There were some very entertaining moments within the game. Some real clutch scores like the to go coming down the straight when Peter Cook and, and Johnny Maloney's point on his right foot when he just decided like okay I'm sick of this let's let's go and win this game takes on his man and. And rant it over, and um, so from that perspective, yeah, I, I have to say I did enjoy it. Like I thought, there was there was uh, probably another game. I, if anybody was watching on the stream, you wouldn't have seen it. But there's a right bit of niggle between these two yeah. teams. Like there was a real, real edge to that game. That and you know, I don't think it necessarily crossed the line or anything like that. But I think that's good to see. Like the, you know, this is this is becoming a increasingly becoming a, a big club rivalry in Galway when you look at the history between the two clubs, and even in that when you see. You know, you saw the incident with John Daly and Sean Kelly before the ball had even been thrown in and they're getting familiar with each other and that stuff just was playing off and all over the field. And um, geez, uh, Johnny Maloney must have a lot of friends in my belly because they all had a lot to say to him. Um, so, yeah, look, it was, I mean, all that stuff I've added into it to my mind. So, yeah, I, I mean, I'm not going to, I'm not going to dismiss people who weren't entertained by it, but I, from, in terms of value from money perspective, I thought this game delivered. 
Mycullen started really well, 3-0 up, possibly even had a chance at the very start of the game, but Desi's kind of pulled, he gets the free, he looks really sharp early on. But like in the first half in particular, it was it was a really enjoyable half of football. My Cullen go 3-0, then they go uh 6-4, and even then um Montpellier to claw back right before going in at halftime at six all. Yeah, and even at that, I you never thought Montpellier were out of the game. So as that, that you know, my gonna start the well and from a scoreboard perspective, but Montpellier were a right amount of chances that they just didn't click. Barry McHugh had one when he was coming on the loop. Um, oh, for any other one, he's probably coming in against the stand where he actually would have been better. I think I, I've seen him kick his left foot and he can do it, but he just tried it. I don't know if you remember that on the outside of his right, just trying to pull it across the, the near post. Um, but they were creating chances, they were actually cutting through and it, was, it wasn't was necessarily sticking. The thing about my goodness, they're such a hard team to usually to penetrate in that middle third. Like, there's so many monsters there, their stand up tackling is excellent. So, the fact that my belly were actually making progress, were getting you know joy after a kick out. Um, that all kind of boded well, and then so slowly but surely they started to to claw it back. And um, I think that from a mobile perspective, the, the stuff with the goalkeeper, I think that was a killer. Like it really stymied the momentum in their back level at that stage. He probably should have gone off, and he took a kick up, put it out over the line. Um, and you wouldn't mind, but their you know the replacement comes on, and he absolutely drills a kick out, an incredible kick out straight off the bat. Um, so that really stymied their momentum. But yeah, like my my set up just all they kind of play the way they play. You know, Dave Wynn is going to drop off and cover the D. Uh, Maloney is going to be doing that if they want to get another, you know, two uh, kind of whatever you want to call them sweepers in that zone. He drops off as well and sits free. So on the flip side, then you saw I talk Colomanian from Mabellu had a Trojan game to, to win yeah, forward, ran himself into the ground. Absolutely, yeah. And he, you know, he was allowed a bit of leeway because, as I mentioned, you know, the, the tendency is that my Cullen, my Cullen will not, you won't carve him open. Very difficult thing to do. Like they, they're, they're half backline sit and hold their structure. So they'd rather let a guy like that run himself up and down the ground and find that leeway and you know, I once said you want to kick out over Peter Cook which was very <laughs> an incredible thing um, so but yeah and then from that moment on you're starting to wonder Mabelli you're probably going to from I don't know about you but from the moment when that stuff went on the keeper and my corner weren't rattled you were thinking you're, you're going to need a goal here it's going to need that big drama in the edge of the square for, for them to, to get over the line and unfortunately from their perspective it didn't come Have you seen my Collins approach differ this year? No um not necessarily. There's a couple of things on that. Like it's uh so you have to I think you have to press their kickoff because when they get the ball in their hands, they're so controlled with how they go about it and they will probably get shots off they're not necessarily gonna cough up a huge amount of turnovers, won't necessarily pump a huge amount of ball inside either. Um even sometimes you kind of see runners at one stage, you know, in the first half, James McLaughlin made a great run right down the middle, and it just all I needed was kind of a pop pass into the top of the day, and he was in there. But um, I think it was Aiden Claffey just turned and recycled the ball back out and, and maybe didn't try that. Well, well, it made a 50-50 ball. Um, but so you, t- from that perspective, I think you have to press their kick out. The problem is when you're pressing their kick out is that they've got monsters around the middle of the field that are very difficult to compete with. And if you can't do that, maybe your tendency is to let them have the ball and try and tr- turn them over further back. Um, so not from that perspective. They're probably hamstrung by, somebody said to me on Saturday, right, that Neil Walsh is actually carrying uh, a knock carrying an injury so that's why he's not starting games and he was just such a prolific shooter for them during their club campaign that that has hindered him it's a huge amount of it still probably off uh, Desi Johnny Maloney has been a you know all joking aside he's been a massive addition like he's just uh, just a real top end class footballer um, you know some small little stuff that he does in terms from defensively is very impressive he actually, in the, I thought one of the most impressive things he defensively was I don't remember the late strip tackle he did in the quarterfinal um, in per stadium as well just in the edge of the goal you know, shows the man the line, lets him go, gets a hand around side, plucks his pocket, and away he went. But uh, the points kick at the end was was just class. So I wouldn't say they're they're probably layering what they've done previously, but there's nothing there's nothing drastically different to to them we we've seen previously. It even felt like when Montbellu hit back level at that stage, and Miho Riley's score is really crucial, puts them um nine eight ahead. But on that, Montpellier nearly had three similar shots and they were almost like kind of three Gary Owens, which went into Andrew Powers' hands. You talk about the way Mike Cullen set up, but when you're playing against a system like that, and I think anyone knows who, who plays Gaelic football or has been involved, there's nothing more demoralising. Yeah, and it's just, that's the thing, they're so hard to cut open. Like they're a really difficult team to, to get through and you're probably... um. 
you're probably relying on I know I know you know I remember that ball that went to Michael Daly in the corner and he's trying to come around the outside and you know you've got this you know you've the tendency is that you're going to take on your man and you're going to go past him and get your shot off but then there's another man riding behind them so you try to the speculative shot and it doesn't necessarily come off um, and I even remember when they played Sautel it was interesting I don't know if you remember at the very end of that game there was a point in it and uh, the instruction I could hear Sautel roaring you know, try and bring him down the line and draw a free because they just knew you're not going to get down the centre channel against that Michael team so to, your best bet is probably to take a ball to the sideline go down hope this is a lazy arm across that you can lean into and throw the head back and um, you know fingers crossed Lavelle could come up and kick the free to, or Rob would kick, kick the free to, to level it didn't work out but that's what you're relying on against my column because they're just they're so solid they're so well organised uh, in that centre channel they've got some excellent stand up tacklers they actually also have players who you know you see the just that really athletic middle third that's just a killer like from the two Kellys to you know you can actually you can make a case that from the two Kellys to Peter Cook to Tom Clark if Davern starts in midfield to Maloney to Dave Wynn, to Aidan Claffey, they could all play. You could all swap their position and it wouldn't matter. Like, they could swap that half-back line to their half-forward line or swap them the back. They're all just really versatile athletic players who fish modern football. That's going to become a team on this podcast, I fear. Um, and yeah, they're just, they're a really, a really hard team to beat. Why are they so hard to beat? But you're, you're like trying to get through that centre channel is, is an exceptionally hard thing to do. They've got athletes all over the field. So even if you do... So there's some teams maybe you might, you know, they get back into that defensive structure, you might be able to create a, a one-on-one and then, you know, kind of a give and go. I don't know if you remember Dylan McHugh's the, in the first half, the, we'll talk about that in a second, the, the point where he's just on the sideline, gives it a hand pass into McKay, goes again, kind of identifies a, a matchup that suits him to, to take that on. You're very hard-pressed to find, even if you get that switch and you get one-on-one with any of those micro defenders, very hard-pressed to find one that you're going to be able to drop a shoulder and take on. They've all, they're all just except for man markers. Owen Kelly now has gravitated into that inside line. He's a great man marker, but he's a ferocious athlete. Is that? He's probably he's probably the most athletic given his you know his cross country background and the time he spent in the states. He's probably the most athletic of the Kelly brothers, which is saying something. So they're just like they're just a really well organized, a really well conditioned team. And um, they've got you know exceptional players all, all over the field. You're gonna I think you you are relying on trying to trying to carve them open to a certain extent, and that's a very difficult thing to do. You need to be much more a football man than me to do that, Paul. Just on my calling, do you think there's going to be a motivation with these players now because it's the first time they face curve in and knock out football? I know they played them last year in the group stage of the championship, but curve in are obviously considered uh, during that period the greatest uh, ever go uh, senior football championship side in the club championship. But for these my calling players, do you think there'll be a motivation now? They want to be considered a great team to go and be curved in here. Absolutely, yeah. And I'd say that there's a dual end to that, isn't there? There has to be. Like, from a car film perspective too, there's, you've got guys, you know, your Farhers and Ronan Steeds and Michal Lundis who, I'd say, have been hearing for the last couple of years about just, you know, my cut in the next super team or super club in, in Galway and the stretch of dominance and all, you know, they see a flood of my cut players going with Galway. And I think they're conscious of that too, that, you know, Carfin haven't gone away, evidently haven't gone away, and they're fairly intent to prove that. So there's I'd say this huge motivation for my current perspective in terms of what they could prove by winning a final um and then kicking on in uh you know in Connacht. You look across the board like the there's a you know there's a real pathway to get back to the stage for every for whichever team wins that final, there's a real pathway to get back when you consider uh you know from a everything I've seen of the Mayo Championship this year wouldn't leave you you certainly wouldn't fear Brave or uh, Balanato and a, a major extent um, Bridget we actually played them in a friendly uh, or in a challenge game a couple of months ago and they're, they're a right good team but even that I still think whoever wins this would probably have too much for them so you know you've got a, a brand new winner in Sligo and all the emotional baggage that comes with that so there's there's a real path to a, an all Ireland final for whichever, or an semi-final sorry for whichever team gets over the line here Just on my value it was an impressive performance there was chances there for them to win that game they just hit a few short. Where does this group go from here? Because they have been on the road for quite a while. Um, but amazingly, that was their first time having a full team since the kind of final against poor Pierce's. Yeah, and it's not really it's not, you know, it's not really a full team, is it? Like if they Yeah. I, I feel I feel very sorry for him. Like you've got when you take consideration that like Patrick Kelly just needs football and I think he went six months basically without playing a game. I also wasn't training, so that's a I imagine what another two weeks would have done for for a guy like that. Uh, Michal Daly is also coming back 
there's they're just I think they're they were hamstrung to a to a certain extent by that. They're like in terms of if they got from one to fifteen, if they got everybody fit and firing for next year, there's easily a you know a, like always like title there for them. I wouldn't geez, you wouldn't be ruling them out whatsoever. Um, so they're probably you know probably a couple of things they wanted to add on. Maybe disappointing with the, some of the lows they had in the, the group stages, but all the Jesus, but like all the raw materials are there for my brother to, to come back and um have a right hit at it again next year. You wouldn't have you wouldn't have any fear about him. You just think it's vital for this group now to stick together, and not make any drastic changes. Yeah, and I think like you know, there's probably an element where you would want you'd want your forward line firing a bit better. I would say like mm-hmm. they kind of remind me some of the things they do in terms of how they you know sometimes they free up more and to sit back and come to the back line. I mentioned the way Manny works up and down. Um, whichever Paul or Leo Donnan, whichever one them in half forward line, they're very kind of similar pairs. They both take a score, both will work exceptionally hard. You've got a great spread then with you know between like if they got Finnerly McHugh, Kelly and Daly all fit and firing, geez, that's that's awesome. There's a few in the county that could rival uh, that from a forward line. So I don't think it needs any a drastic change or anything like that. Like, and the reality is like the, this thing, there's fine margins in, in games like this. Like if the a different referee sees that long ball and the the pull and maybe they give a penalty and suddenly you're talking about a you know a Michael and a rejuvenated team back all the players back what it would mean for them to be in a final their motivation that would come with that for them so yeah I wouldn't and I don't think anybody in that the club necessarily would be saying that either I don't think it needs to take anything drastic for them to, to get back where they need to be just before we kind of get into the other semi final between Kerfin and Milltown yes yesterday there was a question that came in and it it seems to kind of interest everyone around this time of year. Who's standing out in the club championship to get a go away call in? Is there anyone that's jumping to your mind um, straight away? Um, I, I just a really hard question to answer. And I, 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 like this speculation goes on in every county, but I think it's a very difficult thing to identify club players in. Uh, in modern football, to a certain extent, uh, there's there's this element that that where the guy's going to take a jump, and instead of seeing previously maybe you might go and you'd see a guy with huge potential, you're probably seeing a maybe unpolished diamonds guys with a lot of upside who would need a a good degree of work, or maybe lads who've been floating around in development the development squad for the last two years who might be able to take a step. So all that said, anybody who stood out to me, a lot of them have been involved previously. To be honest, you know. I, like I think I Jack Ryan from Milltown is an exceptionally talented fo- uh, footballer and he's just such a you know a dogged defender. Rory O'Connor is another one, but two of them have been in and around there before. Um on the team at June, I think Brian Mannion has a very good year. Um but again, a guy who's been around the squad before, you'd fully expect Nathan Grange to get the call back. Again, a guy who's been in and around the previously. So in terms of um uh, and even you know, you're looking at the upside from a from a young perspective. I think Killian McCurry has been very was very exciting in the it's been a championship again. We all knew about his potential. Sam O'Neill was absolutely incredible at times for James and then suffered a very serious knee injury so he's going to be out at least until the, you know you'd be hoping he'd be back for the end of the league but even at that it's hard to see it so there's not you know there's not one screaming this guy has to be brought in at all costs player who he needs to be brought in there's a lot of guys with huge potential who've been very very good for their clubs and would probably I know have what it takes if they could get in get more get time in around that uh, senior environment and uh, kick on from then but in terms of that I don't see a silver bullet in in the county. I just I don't see that one guy who's going to come in and immediately come into the fifteen. I think those days might be gone. There's different talks going around the county at the minute that Desi Keneally and Owen Finnerty might not be part of the goal. Yeah, like uh, that it, that it's going to be their own choice. Um, this year that they mightn't uh go back in. Conan on Saturday, as we were saying off air, they were the two best forwards on show in <laughs> Pierce, Pierce Stadium on Saturday. If you report to us, how important is it to get two players like that and just try and convince them to come back in? It's just a killer. Like I can imagine there as a any you know intercounty manager is going through these games and he's saying to himself, I need if you look back on last year, you probably need two or three inside forwards who just add lovely to what we built built very well last year. And then you see the two best players in the picture. The guys have been around there for for the last couple of years, you know, have been, have been exposed to it, and um, and you know they, they probably tried to layer on to that last year in terms of Killian McCurry coming in and getting it, you know, he came on against Armagh. That was his debut, the the game in Leitrim, um, came on that day. But yeah, like you know the that depth, even if you're not necessarily saying they're gonna they're guaranteed starters in the one fifteen, that depth is just vital because as we saw injuries could 
totally change your season and you really start to to dig down into your reserves and if you don't have them there you're starting to panic so um there is there's definitely an element from a, a goal perspective where you're trying to get guys who've been around there to, to just commit to not just a year like two or three years of being exposed to it and, and hopefully kicking on um, and then you might be able to introduce a couple of new faces with that too but um yeah like from a it's just been the like an inside forward from a goal perspective you're thinking if one of these really high potential in club forwards that we've had could have a great club campaign and carry that back into county what would they do for us and then you know you hear that talk about Canadian Infinity Tom O'Connor <laughs> misses the, the final game for qualifying another guy you were thinking could make a leap and I'd, I'd say just cursing their luck that this is the way that the club championship fell on top of that then you've got serious injuries for two of your three best midfielders in, in Sam O'Neill and, and Killian McDade so I just think it's it's just been a very <laughs> very taxing and in some ways frustrating club year from a from a development perspective yeah, particularly with some of those um injuries and just now to get into Curve in Milltown, Curve in three thirteen, Milltown two twelve. Uh, I know yesterday you were at the Clare Ireland final, but I presume you probably looked at the score at in the first half and said, Oh, this is done now and then probably like everyone got a bit of a shock in that second half and just kind of very hard to wrap your head around what happened. Yeah, I, I didn't get a shock. I honestly, did, I, did, I genuinely did not get a shock with this because I would have got a shock if any other team were playing Carfin other than Milton. But, um, like, I, I'm sure we'll, you know, laud Carfin and lavish him with praise in, in a couple of minutes, but I just have so much admiration for for that team and that that club and their, um, you know, like, like we're talking about rural clubs and what's going on around Galway and the fact that they're, you know, they're really fighting for numbers, but they still seem to turn out competitive teams in every single group. That culture team that won the the minor Northport C in Persaidum last weekend, uh, I think Milltown pushed them closest in the Northport final. Uh, that's, you know, that's under 17. And they just seem to do that at every single level. Um, they seem to get the absolute most out of them. They've got just never say die attitude that it's just, it's so laudable. You know, you think about... What, what is it for you? I don't that, know. What, I just, it must be a culture but in that club that is just... You no, know, I'd, I'd, I'd heard previously a lot of those players would be involved in other teams within the clubs and, you know, the Blakes might coach their, their junior ladies team and that kind of stuff. But there just seems to be just such a... An, an admirable ability to, to dig in and dig deep and, and claw back. You know, they concede a soccer punch of a goal early on. Uh, they're going long with everything kick out, kick that, you know, long kick out. And Blake just comes so, that, that catch in the first half from the kick, it was just, it just mm-hmm. is, you know, it reinforced everything. His brother does the exact same thing for the goal at the edge of the square. Just again, a, a free catch. They've got this incredible ability. Before half time, again, you know, you're kind of back into the game. It's, you've conceded two goals, yeah, but you're still, you're coming back. You can see it another just sucker punch of a goal. And what did they do? But go up the other end and Blake puts the head down, drives through, wins a free. Mike Mara comes out, kicks it, you know, a, a great point over. And you're thinking, you know, they just have just such an admirable ability to to dig in, to, to never say like to, you know, to fight for. For, for every single ball, it's I, I you know you obviously I, I don't know what it is, Paul. Like do you give Jarrett Jennings credit and their management credit? They've obviously got you know some very intelligent people involved in there from a coaching perspective. But just the, what the club does, their ability to get the most out of themselves in every single sense. Somebody said to me when Barna played Cardiff in that game was moved there the last group game to Milton uh, under lights. They got the, the, the fundraise did savage work fundraising for for lights. The uh, what was it called again? The uh, something for scan, um, mm. uh, the fundraiser that they were doing, um, and uh, but you know that was the first senior uh, championship game that they uh hosted at their own club, like for you know to unveil those lights at the early year, how well they did to, to get that done, just from a, from every single perspective, how they managed to get the most out of themselves is a very admirable quality. So uh, I genuinely wasn't that surprised. I didn't think they'd go away. You know they were not going to go down without without a fight. Like I I knew that for a fact. Just on the third goal, it's done a lot, uh, a lot of the rounds around social media today and different bits and pieces. The sun has an impact. Jack McCabe's obviously going for a point there and it, there's a bit of confusion between Connor Nolan and John Martin, the wing back. And it's just one of those where they're going for a point and it ends up being a goal. But And then you look at the second goal, which is a long ball really into Jack McCabe and Curve are kind of hoping for the best there that he'll get to it. Like th- those two goals are avoidable and they're probably the two goals Milltown will look back today and have the biggest regrets over. Yeah. So two, well, two things on that. I I I I I would tend to excuse you on the on McCabe's the punched goal, but just the free, it was just a free. I mean it's just yeah, um it's just a total free goal. Like I it's not something 
I, I don't think you necessarily need to spend a lot of time on the training ground going over that scenario. It's just one of those, um, like I, the golden rule in a lot of situations like that is, you know, whatever comes into small squares is the keeper's responsibility. You just have to have to deal with it. Um, so whether there was a call there, we don't know or, or what happened. But yeah, it's just a total, a total freak goal and massive confusion. The, but the other goal, like that pass from Gary Tice is absolutely, oh, it's just out of this world. But it's even more when you consider about two minutes before that, Dylan McHugh tried the same thing with Sice. One on one, Jay Square tried the ball. He overcooked it. Sice, you know, you can see it in the, the stream, turn around and let the head off him. And then he drifts out. And it was nearly, you know, a, I'll show you how this is done type of thing where he just, you know, an absolutely perfect ball. It was coming lovely. So I, I don't know if that was as much a, you know, a soccer much or a free goal as that was something that Carfin had, had worked. They clearly coordinated. They were going for, you know, Sice kicked the mark early on in the game. McCabe should have had one a couple of minutes later when he's breaking out to the to the line. They were clearly going for that long direct ball early. They probably saw that it was on. I think that might have come from analysis that was done during the week. But th- that was something that they clearly drilled down on from a car frame perspective. Whereas, you know, I as as diligent and organized as they are, I don't think they necessarily would have planned for McCabe to drop a free short the way they did. So one of them was probably down to something that was being drilled in training, and the other one was total, you know, just a free goal. It's just really a bad spell of luck that that does it for you. It's not a day because we've talked about Middletown and how, uh, their ability to go to the well, but you have to admire them because against Kervin, it's very easy to throw in the towel when things are not going your way. Even the way Kervin played, they're holding on to the ball now for longer periods than obviously we've seen the previous Kervin teams do. But like to not throw in the towel when a team like that is on top of you. Yeah, and even like Paul, it's the sometimes it can just be the little stuff that has just a major consequence. If you look at the the last goal, the second Milltown goal, uh, that's you know that comes from a, a long ball drilled to the edge of the square. It's a classic situation. Forward and defender just you know racing up the ball, forwards out in front, and Jack Cran just managed to you know jump, get a hand in, break the ball out in front, and that's just that's want you know that's literal. That's all that is. That's appetite for for that you know a, a raw ball. That's you know literally throwing your body on the line and uh, and getting it out of there. So and um, that kind of stuff is just. They were such an incredible ability to, to do that. And even, I was just looking at it there, like there probably was a method to their madness. You know, if you look at the stats from this game, uh, just from, from a kick-out perspective, Carfin on their own kick-out, like we're, are, you know, they're always exceptionally strong from it, but they scored 2-4 on their own kick-out. Uh, Milltown on their own kick-out, you know, probably not necessarily as beneficial, but they scored six points. But the interesting thing is, even though, you know, they lost, Milltown lost 10 of their own kick so they were just pumping the ball. If anybody watched this game, they would know what I'm talking about, pumping the ball on, mm. hoping you can win it out there. If it doesn't necessarily work out, but if you look what happens after that, so you know if they lose their kick they lost 10 kickouts, and you would have thought Carfin would go to town on that. They conceded four points off that. But on the balls where they were managed to, you know, even if they lost the ball and managed to force a turnover, they were still scoring. So in, in total off that, if you look, you've added it, you, you, you know, that one turnover after kickout. You scored nine points on your own kickout and you've only conceded four. Like that's phenomenal. Against Carfin. Like that's you know, that's absolutely phenomenal return. So there was probably a method to what they were doing. They did zero wides in their qualifying, not a single wide, they did three wides in this game. One was a free that was from a difficult angle that maybe in hindsight, you know, uh, it looked like Martin just he just kind of hooked it at the, to, the, to the near post that maybe in hindsight that's when you try and work short. But their shooting efficiency is, you know, that's two games in a row absolutely off the chart. So there probably is, it's not just down to, you know, as much as you would praise their character and their resilience, there probably is a lot of very good coaching going on with that. But yeah, they're just... They're a very admirable club. Like there's a lot to there's a lot to like about them. To get into a semi final this year was a great story. Carl Blake was just tremendous when they put him on the edge of the square. Uh, second half, you see Jeremy Blake come on as well towards the end. You see Damien Brennan come on in the middle. Like it just referenced so much throughout the club championship that these Warriors are are just going to the well every day. And then you mentioned Jack Curran, who was tremendous yesterday at six. Probably definitely earns a goal we call in after his club championship and Liam Costello as well, really good at stages. And even, yeah, I, you know, I, I agree with everything you said there, but even you look how hard Keith Manion worked for his first points the, when he was just, you know, it's kind of burrowing through and managed to, to, to throw a boot at it. Brennan's point to the same time, they seem to be working, you know, it, t- t- it took them a lot harder to get their scores, but they were willing to do that. That works. So, yeah, there's a huge amount, as you mentioned, the, the, you know, like the, the the two goals the second goal is a bit of a weird one I, I, I'm i not really sure what I think he gave the goal because he was just going to give a penalty anyway but it, it did look like he threw the ball into the uh, yeah, I wasn't the goal. sure did he kick it in um, it was hard to tell really, yeah. Replay, anyways. yeah it was yeah and, I mean, and if he did then yeah, you know, I'd hold my hands up on that but uh, um, but look yeah just more broadly on that point yeah there's just like 
you know, from, from down the spine, I agree. I think that, you know, Costello has been uh, brilliant this year. Karan, I thought he was immense. Like, I just think he's such a, a raw dogged defender. We seem to have a lot of him in this county at the minute, but he definitely, you know, fully merits uh, a closer look over the, next, over the winter anyway. If you curb him, what do you make of that? I for, for I, I don't know. Like I for, for forty five minutes, I thought Carfin were really good. I noticed maybe talk about them not being the same Carfin they they were. Um, but I, I, like I t- I did think they did a lot right. The you could I clearly see as I mentioned that they were trying to kick the ball longer earlier, uh, a bit more. Um, you know, they I think they're the big thing for Carfin Paul is that they don't have the same quality or color repair that they had. Previously, and it's it's just it's a very hard thing to get over when you don't have just an energy start at the group stage like a house on fire, Ian Burke is away. Um, when you look back on the three in a row team, um, like I you know, I mentioned to you the, the Gary Sice thing there. Like I think Gary Sice is five points if you include the freeze and marks. He created two goals if you want to consider the the free he won for, for McCabe's as well. He's at the assist for the point just after half time for Wall's point, and he's another secondary assist. Like his fingerprints are all over their attack, so they're still reliant on Michael Lundy comes on, fists over two points. That was really quick hands for that breakaway point as well, just to to you know create the assist for that. So they're still reliant on a lot of that court, and they're waiting for some of these young players. Do look very promising. I thought Egan's goal was brilliant, like a really clever move the way he he started and finished it. So they've got like that not on that nineteen team. I think there was a lot of excitement within the club internally about them, and you're finally starting to see, you know, like Tony Wall put his foot down or Tony Gill, sorry, put his foot down. Um, so you know, d- d- there, those young players are coming, but they're at that, they're at that bridging point right now between the old and the young, like guys who are completely not for that club and who carried them didn't for a lot of years, and young guys are coming through and trying to marry them both is is a difficult thing. But I, I wouldn't be as uh, pessimistic, not the word, but I wouldn't be as uh, I, 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 I've been impressed by a lot of what Carfin do. I think they're a very well organized team. Um, they clearly know what they're about. They are. I, I do definitely see an evolution in how they're attacking as well. So, th- they got caught by a, you know, a team that is very hard to shake off. And I think Milton would have done that to, to anybody. They just have this uncanny ability to, to, to not give in. So I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be critical of Carfin for that. You know what I mean? The high ball a concern now though. Yeah, it probably was it. Um. Like it's interesting. I would have I would have argued no before this game because um I didn't necessarily see actually teams having much joy of it. Even when teams did were trying it, I didn't see it become an issue until Blake was in there and they they started to have real you not know, real profit out of it. And on the flip side, then sometimes you wonder, like to, you know, so Milltown go out. Sometimes I wonder, do teams because there's a perception there, do teams decide because based off that not to do something? So let's say for example everybody's terrified of Bernie Prowers kickoffs and they are absolutely exceptional. So Milltown concede every single one, they drop way off, uh, let, let them tap it short and try and, you know, hit savagely hard in the middle third and turn them over there. And then suddenly uh, they kick a f- free in the second half. So from a free, it's a lot easier to press. And for the first time all game, they press uh, Bernie Prowers kickout. And what does he do? He puts it out over the sideline. And then you start to think, what if, you know, why didn't they start that earlier? Like what if, you know, imagine if you tried that 20 minutes ago, what, what could this game look like? This is so easy to say in hindsight, by the way. But So sometimes I kind of wonder, for a long time, I thought teams used to think there was a perception around Carl Finn's full back line that you know that long ball is a concern. And I saw very little evidence that it was working. But last weekend, you definitely saw evidence that it was. I'm just not necessarily sure. Is that down to you know very good delivery and an absolute claw of hands in Blake or versus a huge deficiency in their and their full back line. It's hard to know. Like the, the reality is, Paul, some of the, the more costly scores they conceded was, you know, th- that Mike Martin free that I, I mentioned earlier, the one that he, he pulled on his left. That was a, that was a needless foul. Like Carl Blake was, he, he had him go, he's going to a sideline. You don't necessarily need to, to bundle him in the back there, but he does. You know, that that's, to me, that's more of a concern defensively than these goals that can tend to be hit or miss anyway. On it yesterday, is similar enough to go away. Dylan McHugh and Kieran Malloy's runs really seem to be crucial. Yeah, especially their last two scores. Like the two, the two, you know, when the the game is back and you're starting to worry about it, and it's the two boys who I think I've Dylan McHugh for assist or secondary assist involved in four, which is just fairly normal for him. He's just a just an exceptionally good footballer at that. He also kicked a great point. Um, and then yeah, I I, I thought Malloy might as was, I thought he was quite enough for large spells at that game yesterday. But just when you need him, uh, he just comes to the fore and just. You know, an unbelievable ability to break lines, and they when they when they turn you over like that, and they 
move so fast. Like it's just it's devastating, you know. And that like just looking at it from their perfect perspective, the way they score, like it's something they're really, really good at doing. They're really good at turning teams over and then making the most of it. I think in that game in total, they won 13 turnovers. Of those 13 turnovers, they got 11 shots off. Like that's that's very impressive. Um and you know, they scored one seven off that. So uh like really, really good team when you if you give up the ball, and that's what I mean kind of about the long ball thing. If it works, it's great. If it doesn't, as you know, as I mentioned there, 13 times you give the, the ball to them and 11 of them, so you're going to get shots off. They're such a good team at working that opportunity. So it can come back to bite you as well, is what I'm saying. I'm not, that's not necessarily an argument to play risk adverse football against them, but it just is, it's more a compliment to the way Carfin are able to break a pace and have huge penetrating runners in terms of, um, you know, like Liam Silk in the qualifying was the one who was doing it. We saw it towards the back end of this game where it was Malloy and Dina McHugh. They just have a lot of really athletic players who can penetrate and make very good decisions and when they get into those things and then they, that's oftentimes when they're most likely to kick the ball is when they're breaking on you like that and you're left kind of scrambling and you know from a car frame perspective you probably could have argued they had a, they should have they had two very good goal chances in the second half yeah, and then scrabble, yeah. um, a scramble and that was I thought that was very marginal like I have to see that back again um, but even Lundy's first fisted point I was surprised maybe he didn't I, I, if the game is closer does he does he go for that maybe like your one-on-one on your left foot it probably is a, an angle that kind of suited him um, but you know maybe he took the the sensible option but like they are creating chances they've got you know getting a huge amount off their bench a lot of experience there I wouldn't uh, they're still like a, still an awesome team Just one for you do you expect any of the more experienced players to come in for a county final? Yeah it's a good, really good question I was I think there's a huge case that Lundy could start a final now, um, from a bunch of, for a bunch of different reasons, mainly because he, you know, he he's been there, he does that. I do think he's a nice focal point for them to build around their uh, attack, and he'd complement Sice so lovely in there. Um, I think another shooter would do him no harm at, the, at that end of the pitch. So he he's the only, I think that you know they get a lot in terms of bringing on, you know, I I, I don't. Know, I wasn't there now, yesterday, as as I mentioned, but even just hear the roar on the stream when Mike Farher came on, I think there's a lot to be said for having, you know, formidable options on the bench. But there definitely is a case that a guy like that who was able to knit it together, finish points, but also is another creator, a guy who would compliment. I mean, I, I think I said this after the group stage as well, but the score involvement, like the way Gary Sois, his fingerprints are just all over what they do well in that regard. So another guy to add to that would definitely help them. And um, I could I could see a case that. That he might come in, and then suddenly, uh, from a matchup perspective, it gets very interesting. You know, you've got very good athletes uh, in that my my kind of full back line. So do they start trying to go the other way and try to pull them out of there? And kind of have a fairly good ability to to shift across and not necessarily let that do a huge amount of damage. You got a very athletic half forward line who will cover for that too. So um, I think that would be a, it. Pose an interesting question if they were to to bring him in. Is it an open county final? I think so, yeah, absolutely. I think so, yeah. I, I, I think it could be a very, a very good game. I don't think it's, you know, it's not going to be off the charts shooting, but, uh, I think it's, you know, I'm my Cullen team who seem to have time this year, absolutely lovely. Probably had always ambitions to get back to this stage or even further. Car Finn team who are, as I mentioned before, knitting together to a, an old and a, and a young team, uh, some unbelievable matchups all over the field. Um, you know, if, are we going to see Dan McHugh and Sean Kelly going at each other? Uh, from we mentioned that really, what what's uh, my Cullen do with their half back line, Carfin's half forward line probably does a flip the, the, the opposite. They kind of would tend to drop leads, so they might necessarily face up shorter one on one. But yeah, just in terms of a from a match perspective, I think they, it's it's a very intriguing game. Be really interested to see what what the my Cullen do with Bernie Powers kickouts, for example. Um, the all that kind of thing. I, I, there's a lot in that game that you'd get very, you'd be very excited about. So yeah, I think it's it's a very open game, and I think it will. I'd be fairly confident to say it will be an entertaining game too. Did you expect Mike Cullen to win it? Well, I said it from the start of the year uh, that I thought they, they would and uh, I'm not going to say they change it, but I, I mean, this could be I just a point either way, anything more than a point either way and I'd be surprised. I think this could be a rightly balanced game. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I said it from the start of the year, I thought the way Mike Cullen were going, they're as good as they were last year and then you got a brilliant addition to bring in on top of that. Um, their benches. You know, I, I know I mentioned Carfin's bench. My, my Cullen's bench is exceptionally strong. I think that stood to them at the weekend too. Is that they, they do have those options to come in. Um, as I mentioned, I, I you know if Walsh is fully fit and firing, does it maybe a case that he comes in as well? And that poses an interesting question. Um, 
I, a lot of the, you know, I, I don't necessarily think my column will, but I would be curious to see after watching that Milltown game that they adapt any of it. You know, like they did, they were rotating something they've tended to do at times this year. Davern would spend a bit of time in the edge of square. McLaughlin did it in the semi final, um, but they don't necessarily. They don't necessarily try it that much. I wonder, will they be anyway inspired by watching that game back? The, the honest answer is I don't expect they will. Um, but yeah, to, as I, you know, to, to answer your question, from the start of the year, I said, my colon, I've seen no evidence to deviate away from that, so I'll, I'll stick to that. Just uh, on the senior relegation round robin series, round one results over the weekend. Clannan 115, Spittle 7 points. Nivana Letcher Moore 115, St. Michael's 12 points. Kalanen did seem like coming into this round robin's ears, they might have uh, too much for some of the teams. They put a statement victory in round one against Spittle, but Lettermore beating Michaels is a huge result for Lettermore, but puts a lot of pressure on Michaels now. Yeah, puts a huge amount of pressure. Um, and after just a year from hell, uh, and maybe the, the hangover from that appeals process. Um, and what, you know, I, I think we're still not fully sure if that's, that has actually been put to bed or if, if there's, more, there's more to come in that regard so I presume a lot of the county are going to be watching that uh, anticipated but if we stick to the football for a sec from here for a second yeah it was just that it's a really cool we like, we played that tomorrow a good bit this year and they're kind of they are a really dogged team and um, I kind of t- I thought alright that they might have been lining that game up from a long way out given everything that was going on and just the, in- the inevitable distraction that must have been wrapping around the dressing room from a, from a Michael's perspective um, so yeah suddenly that you know that group is looking as uh, like really finely poised from a Mike's perspective. I think of the two, you know, neither of them are desirable games, but the fact they play Spiddle next, I think you know it's it's probably the more winnable of the two, um, and it's a, you know a chance to right the ship. But I've no doubt the Spiddler have been lining them up too, so you know, it doesn't get it doesn't necessarily get that a huge amount easier. And then from clan perspective, I said they're kind of cursing their luck, and they definitely didn't anticipate being a, in a relegation game, so. You know, but being able to put that to bed as quickly as they did, um, is fairly impressive. But yeah, I'd say this, like I, I know myself, Paul. The these relegations, uh, everything that comes with it is just, it's just you're so tense and so nauseous, and the, the way it kind of drags your your year out, and it's not necessarily an enjoyable time of the year. So I'd say it's, you know, bite its fingernails type of time, right? Yeah. Who do you see getting relegated? Um, I don't see Clannan going down. Uh, I I think they're a really good team. Uh, I, I get another team that are marrying a couple of very talented young players. Um, you know, I look at young Mila there, Mitchell and the wing, and with the likes of Sweeney's and Johnny Heaney. Um, so I, I don't think they'll go down. The other three is very difficult to call, like really difficult to call. Um, I think my I I I could see a kickback in Michael's coming maybe in the Spiddle game, and I could see Clannan maybe winning their game. So does it come down to that final game? <laughs> does it come down to score difference? Please not. Um, but yeah, so uh, it's re- really difficult one to, to call. Clan will stay up, and I'd say, I'd say Michael's to get out of it too for you know, you know, to, to win that spill game and maybe to, to make at least to make that the last game interest. But like, it's yeah, a really, really difficult one to, to call. Yeah, it's going to get really interesting there over the next couple of weekends. Uh, just a reminder, it's, it's two down to intermediate and two survive, uh, in that group of four. Moving on to the um, intermediate. The first semi final on Saturday, I know you're at it. Uh, Kilcomney 13, Ilan Arn 11. What did you make of this game? Um, well, I, it's what I, I missed the first, I mean, 15 minutes of the I timed it badly and got in, um, just to see as Manny was really starting to catch fire from, from what people were telling me. Uh, I, I, I thought it was, uh, Probably wasn't as impressed with this game, to be honest. Like I, I thought there was there was elements of it that were um like a huge amount of kind of sloppy turnovers, just you know, poor ex- skill execution, you know, hand passes not necessarily going to hand, even down the you know, down the closing straight when you're kind of thinking, you know, is it the 38 or 39 minutes when um does the yellow card is shown Manny wins a free they kick their was that their 11 point and you're thinking, okay, now's your time to kind of stretch out and we'll see what's you know what's really there. And for the next well, you know, if you add on at a time, was it nearly 25 minutes or more? They scored two points and probably don't necessarily close it out the way they would have wanted. So from a, it wasn't a it wasn't the most impressive game. It was probably a really tense game. Uh it's a, you probably talk about it in the same way you talk about semi-finals, you know, the usual cliche is that semi-finals are there to be won and you wouldn't necessarily look to guarantee a performance. But it was a right it was a right cagey game, maybe without the 
a similar kind of setup to the, the game that came after it, actually, but just maybe without the that element of quality that would make you sit on the edge of your seat more and um you know find a bit more in it that was that would entertain you. Probably back in the final, uh, it was really Paul Mannion show nine hundred yeah, thirteen points. Yeah, they like and do you know what's funny? I thought uh, Peter Dunnick had uh, who was marking him, he gave him a right, you know, he, it was a right duel, and just sometimes it was just you know, it was like uh, 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 he often was winning the free, the, uh, he was being fouled for winning the freeze, and it was one of those where you know, you might have seen it going, he was trying to get physical with him, trying to, to, to marshal him really well, and just uh, it's a really difficult job to do. Um, but so, like, yeah, he, I mean, he like, was just electric, like, really, you know, really talented footballer. The point he kicked in the second half coming on the, the terrace side and coming back on his right foot and just curled it over lovely was was fairly exceptional so you know really electric forward and you see that a lot of intermediate pull, like the one exciting forwards if you can carve around that and just apply them consistently you saw it with Bannox with Kieran McCurran you've seen it with Monavay with, with what Glenn Kelly has done times this year um, it really does enliven your attack and that's we're talking about this as if it's a, a Galway problem and what we were talking about earlier in regards to inside forwards that's a problem across the county it's a really difficult place to carve out players you see it uh, I, for whatever reason it's just an exceptional definite thing to carve out top end players and when you have them they're worth their weight in gold Last week we uh, had Pico Berra and Aidan Gersey on the podcast who were both playing in the Intermediate Championship this year had them on last year similarly for the Intermediate Final but they were all talk, both of them talking about the Paul Mannion show and how impressive he's been and I know from talking to different Kid Connolly people they'll always sing his praises is he not a player that needs to be involved with Galway in 2024? And I, I, again, another guy, I think you'll get such much. It's, the, the thing about intermediate is, you know, it's obviously that it's probably not a good indictment of Galway football, actually, how little, uh, you know, you look historically, how little they've looked to players outside of senior clubs. Um, and it's probably a testament maybe to other counties where they have kind of a better ability to, to get the most out of that. Or it's a real argument for, you know, you look at the counts like Kerry with the divisional system, there's a real argument for that, um, that they, you know, to get that shop window. But I, I absolutely, you know, from a, just to get, in terms of an exposure perspective, to get him in to, uh, you know, make the step up, get exposed from everything perspective, I think there's a huge case for that. Um, not uh, the flip side too is that or not the flip side, but on top of that too, that I do think at times he was, you know, he wasn't uh as as good as he was. It wasn't you know a huge amount of a one man show. You've seen he's got clubmates there who've been in Galway in recent years and have done pretty well. Um, I shot Ryan O'Neill kicked the great points as well in the first half. So you know he, he was well aided too, but. Yeah, just from a, a goal perspective, you know, there's only so much you can keep knocking the door, Paul. And when you're operating at this level and you keep shooting the lights out like he does, get to a stage where you're starting to ask what else can they do. So 100%, I think, um, get them in, get them exposed to it. I'd say, fingers crossed, Scholar will do what they've done for the last couple of years, which is throw the door open massively. You see a flood of players come for the, the FBD league, but we'll see a huge amount of exposure there. And then they gradually whittle them down for the league and to a, to a championship panel. And you might see a filtration in between lads who have any interest in going to development squads and a lot of lads it sounds like don't they decide not to not to go into them which is you know, sort of right too um but yeah it probably, i'd say for for any pair for any of these guys who are looking to get into Galway, they will need a degree of patience like it's not going to happen overnight even a run might not necessarily happen overnight but um long story short 100 percent get them in anything else jump out for you for good conley they're obviously in back-to-back finals now it's an extremely young team. I think that's what a lot of people would forget about this Kilconley team. If you took the last day, you take Tommy Mannion, Niall Daly, uh, Teddy Kerrigan, Paul Mannion. A lot of these players have are only coming out of under 20 or some of them are still under 20. Yeah, and all I said, there's an element of, which is Tommy Martin's composed with his kickouts, wasn't he? Especially when, you know, when Old Iron were starting to come and he could feel the heat and was, maybe took his time over and was trying to, the voice to a certain extent and you know get the ball off. Um I yeah, I, I think when you're feeling that pressure, that, that's a an admirable quality in a in a goalkeeper. Um and there's also like there's no getting away from ball. There's a massive opportunity here for him now, particularly given it looks like McDade is suffered a serious injury and he's not coming back. That's a massive loss for Monave, both in terms of like systematically, but also just emotionally, like to list, move a missing a leader like that, a guy who struggled for injury, they'd say their their hearts are broken for him. Uh, in that context, so there's a huge opportunity to go and win an intermediate final and and get back up here. You know, looking up from a goal perspective, I, I presume everybody knows this, but we, you know, there is there is an onus on the championship to get back to a. The reason two are supposed to come down from seniors, you're supposed to get back to 16 teams, so you're coming up to a 
what we're going to call a brave new world from a, a Galway Championship perspective in terms of getting back to that system and what that would probably mean a you know groups of four next year and what in terms of from a, what to do for the structure. But yeah, like from a for Kilconnie's sake, there's a massive you know the carrot here is obvious, and I'm sure this was their plan from the, that day. I'd say we say it outright that we're going to get back to this stage and right the, the wrong of last year, not necessarily in terms of the way that game went, but just in terms of getting over the line. I think if you're any other club in Galway, you're just heartbroken for Ireland and Ireland because we all know the challenges and everything they face. Yeah. It's their fourth semi-final defeat in five years that they were defeated in at this same stage. Was it in midway through that second half? Keen Langford comes up, uh, misses a free. There's, there's one or two more wides kind of add to it. it that around that stage. Was that the opportunity for them to push on? Yeah, and those wides are killer, aren't they? Like they just from every single perspective, they kind of suck the life as well. I I thought th- those double headers are weird. And I would I would give a lot of credit to Galway GA. I think um I do a podcast with James Horn and he was telling me about this bizarre thing in Mayo where they you know had four semifinals, intermediate and senior. Not only were they not no double headers, but some of them were scheduled for the same time, so you couldn't see four games, which would just drive me, you know, who, there's a lot of people who would like to see all those games, would drive you around the bend. So from goal perspective, I think those double headers are, are, are a great idea and it's great to see them split across per stadium and tune. But the flip side is, it's kind of weird. You've kind of a, a large cohort of the crowd who are kind of on the fence about whether or not you're going to get into the, the game or not. You know, people who've got in early from the, the senior game and they're willing to engage in the game and give it a chance. And then you see those wise and it just, if it really does settle into people and they kind of sit back from a bit and you can feel that groans is too strong but just people kind of disengage from a game certain sides and it does, it's such a it's really dispiriting I don't, you know, it was an issue for, for us this year too it's really dispiriting when those chances start to slip away so that was that was a really important window and as I mentioned you know that like you look at it I think it's it's 8-11 after 38 minutes I remember looking up at the clock and looking at that and thinking okay what's and now he's looking at it from a economy perspective but they you know, they tap on another two points over the next 25 minutes or so so there was you know and and the, on the flip side too, you actually had the chances to, to claw it back too. So I'd say that's a huge frustration. And from their close perspective, I know I mentioned this earlier, but I did I do genuinely I I genuinely hope it's on and I I've no doubt it is, but it should be on administrators radar that like from West Galway clubs are are struggling here. Like there's a there's a real issue when you see what's what's happened with I think the Carroga now is is really sad to see. Um, we're going to have at least one from the that senior relegation group going down. Potentially, you know, if Spade and let them all go down, I think it'd be really, really frustrating. So, uh, it would have been absolutely amazing and just an incredible story if they'd gotten back to a, the final. But, um, you know, you, you you get what you deserve at, in, at those semi-finals. It probably didn't necessarily get the point that they needed to to get it done. Tom O'Kern and Patrick O'Donnell have just been remarkable in this championship. Yeah, Patrick O'Donnell, especially probably a guy a lot of people would have. Associated more with NYG actually, um, but you know, you know, just such a such a live wire. Sean is a great story too, actually, isn't it? Um, I yeah. think there's there's a, an element of probably uh relief is probably the right word in the rest of the country just to see him see him back, like see him see him playing football and uh and at the level he is, and particularly given, I think it's a really interesting one when you look at how devastating Sean Kelly is further out the pitch and what Sean might bring from a Galway sector next year what that does to the Galway's makeup I think it would be it would be a really interesting question for him to, to, to look at from uh, you know where what do you do from a defensive perspective we we mentioned they're absolutely stacked in that line there's a good a chance as any to maybe move some of someone like a Kelly or a Sweeney up a line to, to the half forward line so yeah it's just you know the truth their form has been Absolutely immense, and particularly you just you could not be but delighted for Sean to, to see him back. Just then on the uh, other semi final, Courtney Jamrocks, uh, 11 points, Monavay 212, or Monavay Abbey 212. Uh, just on Monavay Abbey's victory, that's huge for them considering Killian McDay going off. It's rumored to be a serious injury to his tibia, which is in all likeliness now just with the two week turnaround probably unfortunate for Killian and it, there's probably a high chance he misses this final but a huge result when you consider they lose him and then go on and win the game particularly after losing him after 18 minutes yeah like the, you know, so, the give and talk about give and take you know I just talked about it how great it is to see a guy who's been decimated by injury finally back in the pitch and then you know from McDade's perspective uh, missed the Lee final against Mayo, which was was pretty frustrating. And 
Um, was you know probably struggling through stuff. He's a couple of severe injuries, even in Australia. I think he's so a couple of uh, severe injuries. He would have been a very talented hurler. I remember when he was in with the 21s, he actually broke his finger hurling, um, which had major replications from a football perspective. So it was just been, uh, it's just cruel. Like it's just you'd really hope that maybe we get some good news later in the week and it's not as bad as feared. He he actually didn't seem to be in a huge amount of distress when he when he went down and kind of limped off. Um, but then yeah, I, I mean if it is seriously, it just be. Yeah, it'd be completely cruel from their perspective. Now, in saying that, I thought Monavale's response was was pretty admirable. Um, like the you know how quickly they moved for the penalty. It's just you know it's ball come back out to to Flaherty on the edge of the square, kind of turns inside out. What try doesn't want to necessarily take a shot on his left, gives it off to his wing back, who just comes like a train, puts the head down, wins the penalty. Um, you know, that's the benefit sometimes of taking a man on is if you if you go hard and you're fouled, the referee will give you the the free or a penalty. You doesn't necessarily have to be that you burn a guy and put it over. Um, and then after creating the goal, he manages to, to score a goal in, in the second half. So uh, they responded so well. But yeah, that it's just a major bummer. Like it's a real, you, know, you never. It's not nice to see. It's not nice to see from Daniel's perspective either. The, that hamstring injury, for, uh, and I'd say that was a killer for for Cartoon. You kind of saw him struggling through it and trying to to get past it. Um, but just you know, as I I was actually surprised when he pulled up first. You were convinced he was not continuing on and tried to soldier on for a couple of minutes and looked fairly devastated to to come off. And it's not. It's one of those parts of football that kind of gets you. You know, you feel it deep. You know exactly how they feel. So, uh, it's just a major frustration, and hopefully, maybe it's not as bad as as we're fearing today. They look Muldowney, Glenn Kelly, really impressive from one of them. Uh, Glenn Kelly is just a, I think he's just been class this year. Um, uh, uh, like I don't, he didn't. Oh, he did have one wide actually. The the forty five in the, the the second half that uh, he pulled across the face of the goal. But other than that, his, his shooting is just electric. He's ultra ultra lively. He's been doing that. Paul, he's been doing that from the early rounds of the league right through, just consistently delivering. He's a real live wire forward. Probably a guy who wouldn't have come across as many people traders, didn't necessarily see him as much as maybe we should have with the 20s, but uh, he got a huge seed and uh, you know, an ultra composed finisher. I, I would talk about that, you know, we talked about earlier, a position we need someone in. Um, he's definitely a guy. And Maloney's well, just electric. Like he, he's just. Um, you, you, you kind of get that sense when you're seeing him live, especially that people kind of come alive based off knowing he's going to do something. So they're two, they're two fine players to have. Um, I'd be very excited to see maybe what happens from Glenn Kelly's perspective in particular over the next couple of years. Monave almost kind of always felt like when they put that penalty away, you thought it was comfortable enough for them, but in fairness to Gorgie, like straight after half time. Um, because if Monave go in at the break one five to two points up, but straight after half time, Corton kicked the next three to bring it back one five to five. But Monave's response really impressive then. Yeah, like the, well, uh, the finish for a penalty was was incredible. Like it was a great, you know, full length drive, but it just got it right into the, the corner in the sanction. And then, as you mentioned, you're going in at half time, just demoralized with two points after conceding that. Um, and then they come out at the second half and you know, really start the fire, like, um, just working a lot more. Methodical about how they work points and working to, to right into the scoring zone and manage to, to keep it over and um a huge roar from the bench, which I think is a very underrated thing. It always helps to ha- to kind of have that support and you start to feel our players start to feel energized by it. Um and then yeah, as you mentioned, the the goal again, it's just such a sweep move. Those two hand passes, more than side pass in particular, I, I would say in club football you see like fifty percent, maybe even the majority of those chances break down because of a poorly executed hand pass. Uh, just slightly behind the guys, you know, hand pass slightly up front. Not necessarily giving the pass when you have the runner off your support shoulder, and that was all just perfect. You know, you give the you, you talk about the six inches between your chest plate, but you just want that ball to be delivered coming onto the run. It was a really well executed move, lovely goal, and uh, and you know that's those two goals will made a difference anyway. Who do you see winning the final? Uh, like for, I think I. The very first time I was on the podcast this year, I said Monavé would, would win it this year. I thought they were, we played them in a league and bet them by a point, and I was really impressed by them that day. Um, and I, I'm still kind of inclined to go that way, but I do think that McDade thing, I, I, you know, I'm sure you know yourself, Paul, like emotionally the damage it does in a club, just how you feel, kind of that real disappointment setting in, um, both for him and also what it means for your chances. I wouldn't necessarily underestimate that, but I still, I still would shade it for from one of the, yeah. um, I think they were, you know, really unlucky to go down last year. And so the manner of some of those, and you could see, it was kind of bizarre to look at their score difference and compared to some other teams in relegation and just how close they were in every single game. Um, so yeah, I, I, 
I'll tip it to Monday, but I do I expect that to be a right good game. I don't I won't I don't see either of these games being like this could be the finest margin stuff for uh both intermediate and senior final. Just on the uh intermediate uh final round in the re- relegation round robin, yeah. so in your system to what we have at senior. Can Kerncon Byrne and Kerfin B survive? They stay up. On Karua and Killer Aaron are relegated. On Karua and Killer Aaron contested the 1999 county final. And it's just really hard to fathom how both of these teams, well, particularly Karua, when you consider a team goes from senior to junior in the space of two years, but. It does feel like a big blow to go at football with two real kind of traditional clubs finding themselves in junior football. Yeah, and uh, Ankar Aru kind of they they heralded the onslaught of the uh, as Kevin West used to call them the Westies. Like they, I think they were the first Welter club to win a county title when they won it in the nineties. They you know, contributed to some fabulous footballers to to go that goal team. John Amat, he looked to them kind of immediately. They became a lot of a lot of stars from him. Um, and yeah, like it's just. Uh, you know, I I know I could mention earlier. I, I two clubs, two rural clubs, really struggling for numbers underage in particular, and it just ends up catching up. And yeah, in many ways, actually, it's very predictable that they end up at this stage. Um, and the thing that'll probably get them out of them is that the incredible character within both clubs. But yeah, like it's just, it, especially from a career up, like to see it to how quickly you know. I think I there's a real lesson in lesson is the wrong word, but there's a real warning for a lot of clubs. And when you see how quickly you can slide, yeah. how quickly you can just get away from you. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, you know, I can remember this time. Uh, no, it was even sooner before the league final. I sat down with Billy Joyce, uh, Park's uncle, yeah. who you know would have been uh, a complete star would of Ireland. He's done a huge amount for them. Um, and I remember him talking about how excited he was with some of the young players who were coming. And finally, there was other guys' faces he wasn't necessarily familiar coming for Ireland, but maybe they just came a slight bit too late. Now it, it sounds like, you know. I, they probably have what it takes in terms of if they want to, to get it together and come back up. But yeah, just a, a sad day for, for both clubs. Kind of a worrying day, I would say, from just a broader perspective to see what's happening for, for certain rural clubs. But it's not, you know, the solution to that is very complicated and it's not something we're going to stumble across on a, a podcast like this. The bad for goal football. It has to be, yeah. I, I you know, there's, there's no getting away from it. You want a, a broader base and you want, especially these rural clubs, to be able to compete. There's probably a this is as much a social issue as is a, a goalie football issue, or probably more so actually. To Paul, like the, the rally is at post COVID, a lot of these clubs you saw the huge amounts, a lot of people that kind of emigrated from. It just so happens that when you've got kind of these urban bases, it tends to keep people a bit more, and you seem to hold on to them a bit better. But you, you just look at the turnover in some of these clubs, and it's it's kind of stark. Um, and I, you know, you you need from from a lot of these clubs, you, you just need kind of one or two young stars to build around, and if they're not around. That's a killer. Like if if Fiona Ali is not around for on Spittle, it drastically changes their relegation prospects. Um, and other clubs might have a, a bit, slightly better degree of depth to deal with that. But yeah, especially like the you know two clubs, two kind of story clubs, very historic clubs in golf football. They see them both go down. It's not you know, just nobody will be able to tell me it's a good thing anyway. Yeah, for sure. It does. It does feel like a dark day for both of those clubs, but um, they'll be looking to get it back up and running um for next year in junior football. But that's all we do have time for uh on today's uh football podcast. Uh, we'll be back next week. Um, with a look ahead uh to the county finals in senior and intermediate. But that's all uh for today. Thanks to Mars as always for coming up.